Gaponera, the Matabele ant. These powerful predators are twice the termite size. With the colony's hunger driving her, a Matabele scout searches for a target. shadow and what it means. War is coming. Soon. They can do nothing as the scout marks the target and a path to their home. The scout returns to the main force to recruit a raiding party from among her sisters at an abandoned termite mound the Matabele have commandeered. With a jolt of pheromones, the chemical message travels among the warriors. It's a perfect time to attack, early in the day, before the heat rises. Matabele move out with the ominous, deliberate pace of a Roman legion. Like legionaries, the ants wear armor. Their exoskeletons can withstand all but the harshest blows. They sting with highly toxic venom. But their heaviest weapon is their jaws, able to rip opponents to shreds. A raiding force can consist of 600 ants. the battlements, ripping open mud galleries, probing for cracks in the wood. Now, the smallest Matabele attack. These tunnel rats make relentless forays into the termite sanctuary. Heavier troops, some more than two and a half centimeters long, line up for the grisly harvest. It's the devil's buffet. All you can kill, all you can carry. One raid might tame 4,000 victims. When the Matabele have all the dead termites they can manage, they head home. In a single day, a Matabele colony might send out three or four such forces. will move their base to richer hunting grounds. But today, their young will feast like kings, fattened on the spoils of war. Violence 
is the imperial tool, wielded in many ways. Sometimes to disrupt, sometimes to control. A queen can seize power with the victory of each individual soldier. Or by overwhelming force. Some empires grow so large, they send everything fleeing before them. Panamanian rainforest, Esitan, the army ant, rules its turf with massive numbers. Army ants travel in deadly columns, a lethal force ever on the move. But this is not an attack. These ants, 500,000 to 700,000 of them, have been marching all night they're young in tow. Theirs is a nomadic existence, embodied in their bivouac. Army ants are their own fortress, a living, breathing domain that travels on countless legs. And those legs are strong. One esitan hanging by its claws can support another hundred ants. For a man to match that feat, he'd have to hold up three armored vehicles. Deep in the recesses of this mass of ants are hidden 200,000 unhatched young. And the esitan queen she lays eggs by the million, keeping the colony alive and forcing it to find sustenance. Dawn and the bivouac stirs. After a night of stillness, the colony A meter-long mass of legs and feelers rouses itself into action. The ants begin columns that branch apart and widen, becoming an invincible tide that can travel 300 meters a day. It's called a swarm raid, and it consists of several hundred thousand ants. Ants move in a deadly wave, 15 meters across, driving all before them. Those who fail to flee are doomed. Whatever army ants can catch, they consume. The attackers shred their prey so they can carry it back to feed the young. Army ants even overpower the land. They instinctively form bridges that carry the swarm over gaps and gullies. Across these living structures flows a steady stream of corpses. 30,000 a day.
but army ants have enemies. Along the swarm's edges, bandits try to pick off stragglers. Paratrachina, or crazy ants, are the anarchists of the forest. Small, but highly organized, they are willing to do anything to grab a meal. Infiltrate, attack, abscond, whatever it takes. Instead of stingers, the crazy ant has spray jets that spew paralyzing venom. It lets the cruel little soldiers take down much larger opponents. Army ants fear their crazy cousins for the chaos they unleash. The bigger insects have to fight for their lives against the anarchist throngs. At first, the crazy ants' venom stuns the army ants. Then the effects wear off and the army ants regain their strength. They handily escape the tiny pirates and return to the business of the raid. In a week, an army ant colony kills and eats 250,000 creatures. Ravaging the landscape, army ants shred its sense of order. In another kingdom, the ruler maintains control by any means necessary, even torture. The Empress can afford to be gracious. She has enforcers to do her dirty work. Relentless surveillance and oppression of any who deviate from the rules. In the kingdom of Mellifera, order is the order of the day. Every day. Mellifera, European honeybees, seem to lead a sweet existence. Gathering pollen and turning it into gold. But beneath this bright image lies a dark reality. The colony exists to serve the queen, who lays the eggs that become the workers, who maintain the hive, and the warriors who defend it. Below the queen ranks the colony's young, its future. She who must be served and those who must survive dominate the hive's existence. But if something didn't keep the hive's inhabitants in line, bee society would fall apart. Every female has it in her to lay eggs, to be a queen. But the colony can have only one ruler. So, it has a police force to ensure that fact. Enforcer bees patrol constantly, checking the cells, tracing the lineage of suspect eggs. making sure the guard bees stay on their fuzzy toes. The police are on the alert for subversive social deviants, revolutionaries. And in the hive, it takes very little to cross that line. 
All a rebellious female needs to do is lay an egg. By the regulations of the Mellifera police state, that's a crime. One bee is breaking the law. She deposits an egg in what she hopes is safety. If they thought they could get away with it, half the bees here would do the same. And the hive would fall into disarray. That's why police bees make their rounds, searching for evidence of insurrection. And they find it. For them, an outlaw egg contains the seeds of a colony's destruction, and so it must be destroyed. And to drive the lesson home, they brutalize the offender, keeping the hive safe and the queen's position secure. Natural order demands surrender. But in other realms, something far worse awaits. In the Imperial domain, it is not enough to rule. Others also must serve. By abduction and terror, the Empire assures itself of slaves. Warriors carry the captives into servitude. Strangers in a strange place. In Arizona, the kingdom of Polyurgus needs its slaves. The Queen has her consorts warriors to do her bidding. All of these live royally, thanks to a servile class. Polyergus, the slave raider ant, requires slaves, because the species has grown so specialized, it cannot care for itself. Massive mandibles, perfect for killing, have little use off the battlefield. So this kingdom has two societies. Those who reign and those who serve. The servant ants, dwarfed by their masters, are of the species Formica. They forage for food, raise the royal young, minister to the queen's every need and those of her workers. Born into bondage, they will die slaves. But this kingdom has woes. Its formica slaves are dying of old age. It's time for the slave raiding polyergus to do what they do best kill and plunder. A scout has found a formica nest. She enlists a gang of raiders. A roiling mass of red aggression, spoiling for battle. In an instant, they're off. 1,500 to 2,000 ants flowing across the terrain with a single purpose, seize slaves. Streaming into the Formica nest, the Polyergus raiders unleash hell. They kill, but only when need be. They've really come to steal the unhatched Formica young. In a chilling display of single-minded oppression, Polyergus raiders blow past the startled Formica 
to grab as many pupae as they can. It's not unusual for raiders to carry off 500 to 800 new slaves, decimating a colony. The raiders transport the kidnapped formica brood back to their kingdom. When the stolen formica hatch, they will believe the polyergus nest is where they belong. Another generation of Formica will become slaves. At the wrecked Formica nest, the queen roams amid the ruins, her offspring abducted and enslaved. She has been spared, but in other realms, innocents suffer unspeakable horrors. Some kingdoms steal youngsters to enslave them. Others take no prisoners, slaughtering the defenseless to feed their own young. Winged horror has a name. Mandarinia, the giant hornet. Their reach extends across Japan. Their empire reigns in dark, secluded places. These hornets are at the peak of their powers. Their queen is vigorous. Her workers are strong. Her fighters are many. Her brood chambers are full to bursting. Everywhere, mouths to feed. Countless larvae signal their relentless hunger by scratching at the walls of their cells. The grating drives the adult hornets into action. feed the babies, and hornet babies live on flesh, ground into meatballs, and delivered by their caregivers. The larvae must feed constantly, so a single scout takes wing, ranging far afield to find fresh meat. At nearly eight centimeters long, giant hornets are superb killers. Sharp talons seize prey. Powerful jaws sever limbs and decapitate victims. Compound eyes detect the slightest movement. And this scout has found a fat, defenseless target. A hive full of mellifera, European honeybees. The scout marks it with pheromones. These bees aren't native to Japan. They arrived during the last century, imported because they produce more honey and are less combative. Because the alien bees didn't evolve with the giant hornets, they have no way to fight an attack.
all the bees know to do is mass at the hive entrance. There, they prepare to fight to the death. The hornets are five times the honeybee's size and many times more willing to kill. In the stillness, fierce wings and fearsome odds. Valor has no place here. And yet the brave bees will not surrender or flee. They will kill a hornet or two. But what is one dead hornet when so many live? Reveling as they do in the deaths of bees by the thousand. out to a horrifying end. In only hours, 20 or 30 hornets can wipe out a hive of 30,000 bees. have reduced the defenders to a carpet of the dying and the dead. Now, they can rob at their leisure, sometimes for days. This bee colony is doomed. The victims left to rot. The raiders gorge on honey even licking it from carcasses. The unborn bees will be chewed into protein paste and fed to the hornet young. For every empire that seems invincible, there is an opponent able and ready to exploit an unexpected weakness. Empires attack. But they also must defend themselves. No matter how strong the fortress, the best defense is knowing your enemy. have learned that lesson. For eons, they have thrived in the giant hornet's deadly shadow. The bees of Sarana know the giant hornet send scouts to find their hives. To survive, these Japanese honeybees must capture and kill the hornet scout. weapon. When they spy their enemy at the gate, the soldier bees pull back slightly. Their waggling signals a sneak attack. They're enticing the hornet to enter their hive. When she takes a few sacrificial targets, 
the bees attack. In a haunt, the defenders rush the hornet scout, enveloping her in a wave of bee bodies. But they don't sting. Instead, the bees crowd belly to belly against the invading beast. Vibrating their abdomens, they create a ball of heat that clasps the hornet at its livid core. It's a battle with narrow margins. The bees can stand temperatures up to 50 degrees. The hornet can only survive to 46. The temperature of the core, 47 degrees. For 20 minutes, the squirming orb presses onto its prey. Bees die. Others step up. If the scout escapes, all is lost. Finally, the flailing and gnashing cease. This hornet won't reveal the secret of their hive's location. The bees have paid a price, but they've saved their home. Another kingdom fends off invaders with strong walls and a martyr's devotion. In the land of Macrotermes, jousting for territory and resources never relents. An imposing citadel harbors a colony of African termites. Inside, a labyrinth of narrow passageways and bulkheads designed to thwart invaders. The termites are watchful, lest their citadel fall. But kingdoms' fates often are decided at their borders. A remote outpost can be all that stands between survival and the empire's collapse. Outside the protective walls, foragers collect and transfer food back to the queen and her charges. They also watch for invaders. A Matabili scout appears. With their heads, termites send a subterranean alarm that ripples through the outpost. At the edge of the compound, a platoon of defenders occupies a fallen branch. These soldier termites are strong and agile, prepared to give the last full measure. Few of their kind grow this large and strong. Their jaws can cut through human flesh. The encounter begins by ones and by twos. A raider infiltrates. A sentry patrols. One death and the battle is joined. The ants stream forward, attacking with no mercy. Using their mandibles, the termites attempt a defense. 
It's no use. Some seek shelter, but there's nowhere to hide. Even the formidable termite guards are no match for the raiders' venomous stings, which destroy the termite's nervous system. It's more feast than fight, as ants sting and slash the defenders to pieces. But the warriors who fall here do not die in vain. They stand against the Matabili tide, while their comrades in the galleries organize a last-ditch defense. At the gates, the fighting intensifies. It's a classic tactic. Against superior forces, seize and hold the narrow passage. Stand your ground. Come home with your shield, or on it. The termite soldiers never relent. Sacrificing themselves, they buy precious time for defenders to seal off the embattled bunker. Denied entry, the Matabili withdraw to attack another day. The termite colony is safe but at a terrible cost. The departing ants carry off hundreds of termite corpses that will nourish the invaders. Clever strategies can prevail. So can impenetrable defenses. But there's no way to prevent an attack from within. A kingdom's fate can turn in the blink of a treacherous eye. Power belongs to those who hold it, and to those who seize it. An empress is only as safe as her courtiers allow. When danger stalks the halls, Rulers do well to beware. In the kingdom of Polyurgus, virgin queens have to steal empires for themselves. They cannot inherit this domain. The reigning queen will tolerate no rival. So, a would-be monarch must infiltrate a formican nest murder its queen, and steal her identity. To start their quest, young queens join a slave raid. En route, they mate and shed their wings. A sign that they now bear the seeds of empire. One queen has picked her target. She approaches the Formica nest, ready to seize power. But before this killer queen can attack, she must evade her quarry's protectors. She releases a pheromone. Like a chemical spell, the scent neutralizes and repels the Formica defenders. The colony's heart is where the queen is. And the interloper means to pierce that heart.
she's fixed on her mission. Assassinate the queen and take her place. The pretender's sickle-shaped mandibles have one brutal purpose. When she confronts her rival, there's no hesitation. She savages her prey. Not to eat her, but to steal her identity. Attendants try to pull the wounded queen to safety, but the murderers will not allow it. She laps up her victim's blood and rolls in her spilled fluids thoroughly absorbing the monarch's essence. After 20 violent minutes, the Formican Queen is left to die. The pretender has cast her chemical spell 